All right, we're gonna get started. Last time, I don't have the PowerPoint pulled up, but last time uh, we uh, finished uh, 10A, and uh, today we're gonna be working on 10B. Before we work on 10B, let's see if we can answer some questions, see if anyone's been uh, uh, studying. Now, some of these I've already answered in previous SI sessions. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but just for practice, someone tell me what nitrogenous base that one is. Adenine is correct. Good, good. Uh, let's see, how about... This one I may not have answered yet at SI, but we've definitely covered material. Uh, some types of cancers, such as acute biologic leukemia, are epigenetic diseases, which involve altering DNA in what way? What modification is added to DNA uh, uh, because of this disease? A methyl group, right? You methylate DNA, sometimes you have problems that arise. This uh, methylation of DNA is also linked uh, to aging uh, and risk of mortality. Uh, it turns out that for this particular disease, there happens to be a nucleoside-derived drug, uh, and don't worry if you can't spell it or pronounce it, you'll get a multiple choice answer. But anyone know what the name of that drug was that uh, helps treat this disease? Besides the A, right? Azacitidine, azacitidine. That is in 10A as well, okay? Uh, let's see, anyone remember what ICAR boosts the, boosts the production of? What is uh, the nucleoside drug ICAR? What does it produce the production of? Mitochondria, exactly. It's a uh, performance enhancing drug. Uh, it uh, acts in uh, it, uh, an organism taking this drug. Uh, will end up producing mitochondria at a higher rate than normal. Uh, let's see, let's see. Uh, Okay, all this we'll talk about today. Okay, a lot of this other stuff is just memorization stuff. Okay, so today, the very last thing that I talked about last time, and, I, and I'll probably review it a little bit more today, is uh, the difference between uh, the phrase polycystronic and monocystronic and how that relates to prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So, just a quick review since I reviewed it in detail last SI session. Okay. So remember last time we talked about the very first difference between prokaryotic stuff and eukaryotic stuff. A majority of exam three and about half of the final exam will be based off information you learn about prokaryotic DNA replication, transcription, translation, and eukaryotic, and, it, and in order to understand uh, both of these, you have to be able to compare and contrast them to each other. So, the very first thing that, that we talk about is prokaryotic mRNA versus eukaryotic mRNA, all right? Uh, for prokaryotic mRNA, they use the phrase polycystronic. And in terms of memorization, I just remember that polycystronic represents prokaryotic because they both start with the letter P. Uh, eukaryotic is the other word, which is monocystronic. I don't have anything fancy to memorize that. But these are the two types of mRNA, polycystronic and monocystronic. Here is what they mean. Polycystronic means that for a single mRNA strand, a single mRNA molecule, you can have multiple genes encoded on it. Okay multiple genes encoded and you know if i uh, do a bad drawing here five prime three prime uh this is poly uh, this is a uh, polycystronic mrna gene a would be encoded in there gene b would be encoded in there gene c etc etc all on the exact same strand of uh mrna these genes will be encoded simultaneously contrast that with monocystronic uh, mRNA, which you see in eukaryotes, one mRNA only uh, encodes for one protein, 
And uh, actually, I will adjust this to say protein, technically. So one mRNA encodes for one protein at a time in eukaryote. So five prime, three prime. So the reason why eukaryotes, they have this difference here is that actually in transcription of eukaryotic genes, there's an intermediate type of mRNA called pre-mRNA. This is where it got complicated last time. So I'm gonna to try to reiterate this stuff. So in eukaryotic genes, when it was transcribed, it was transcribed into something called pre-mRNA. Pre-mRNA is a gene transcribed into mRNA, but the mRNA still contains a mixture of exons and introns. Okay, represented by E's and I's. Your exons are the parts of the mRNA that actually code for a protein. Your introns do not. So again, this is still mRNA, and these represent regions of your mRNA in a eukaryotic, this pre-mRNA. Uh, the difference between eukaryotic, one of the many differences between eukaryotic and prokaryotic is that eukaryotic, you have a mixture of exons and introns. Meanwhile, prokaryotic, you never have to worry about that. There is only uh, sequences that encode for proteins. So in eukaryotes, uh, you have interspaced between exons. You have these introns that do not code for anything. So because of that in eukaryotes, there's this extra processing step with mRNA called splicing, okay, where before you can get actual mRNA, you have to splice out the introns and fuse together the exons. Okay, so splice out introns and fuse together exons. You don't have to do that in prokaryotes. Prokaryotes, they make the mRNA ready from the beginning. In eukaryotes, you have to do this extra thing. Uh, so actual completed mRNA, final mRNA, is just the ones with only exons in it. This product that only contains exons in it, again, I will remind you, is just a one protein will be encoded from this, from this final mRNA. One protein can be encoded from this, okay? So that's why we use the phrase at the beginning here, monocystronic, is that one mRNA down here only encodes for one protein. And the way you get to this one mRNA is through this uh, process here where you transcribe pre-mRNA, then you do this extra step for, called splicing, then you get a finished product of mRNA. And so that's what we went over last, at the very end of last session, so I'm going to have to move on to the next material, because uh, there is quite a lot of stuff. Uh, I, I, when, when it comes time for the exam review, I will review this stuff again. Uh, but for today, we're going to move on to some new stuff. So. Uh, by the way, everything that I just talked about is listed in uh, these first few slides in 10B, so please review them. Okay, so 10B goes into more detail about the different types of RNA and some interesting uh, applications and science that is done regarding uh, RNA and DNA. Uh, so first, they go into a little bit more detail about the other type of RNA called uh, rRNA. The, the first stuff that we just talked about earlier was mRNA stuff. Uh, this is rRNA. So rRNA, uh, you don't have to know the really super crazy details. Like in this class, the only important stuff about rRNA is the fact that it is a component of ribosomes. Uh, ribosomes, you might remember from bio 1 or 2 or whatever, those are the organelles that actually make your proteins in your body. So it turns out ribosomes uh, as an organelle component are made of a lot of uh, rRNA. Um, let's see, yeah, there's some numbers associated with that, you know, if you want to compare, you don't have to memorize numbers really, just note that uh, the numbers they, the, in general, the numbers they use to notate prokaryotic ribosomes, 30S and 50S, notice that those numbers are smaller than the numbers they use to indicate eukaryotic ribosomes, which are larger, 40S and 60S. 
This is an overly complicated way of telling you guys that eukaryotic ribosomes are larger than prokaryotic ribosomes, which is the main uh, thing here. And that kind of makes sense, right? A eukaryotic organism is more, is more complicated. It probably needs a larger ribosome in order to translate more complicated uh, sequences. So bottom line, ribosomes are found everywhere. Uh, eukaryotic ribosomes are larger. Oh yeah, and this interesting thing here, in order for these things to actually work uh, in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, they need magnesium. You guys remember the term in, I guess it would be exam two, what term is used to describe magnesium if, that, if, if it's required for these things? Cofactor, right? Cofactor. Magnesium is a cofactor for these ribosomes. Okay. I uh, remember also uh, earlier in 10A that there are some special uh, nitrogenous bases that sometimes arise. You don't have to memorize any of them, just that if, they, if you do read them somewhere, those special bases are most commonly going to be found in ribosomes. Again, ribosomes are made of RNA. RNA can have some special uh, modifications to them. Uh, it's not really a big deal, so I'm going to move right along. All right, transfer RNA. You'll get more detail about tRNA when you get to chapter 30A, I believe. Uh, so this is just some uh, brief mention of it. Uh, bottom line, uh, the point of the, the function of tRNA is that it is an RNA sequence that has an amino acid attached to it. Okay? Remember that the central dogma says that at the very end of the central dogma, you, uh, ribosomes will read mRNA in order to translate them into proteins. In order for them to do that, there has to be an intermediate molecule that links mRNA to the amino acids that you find in proteins. The molecule that does that is transfer RNA. Transfer RNA is a RNA that has amino acids attached to it. More details will, of course, be given in chapter 30. Okay, now we get to some, in my opinion, actually pretty cool stuff uh, that is more of a what is going on currently in science, and you will be asked about this a little bit. And that first topic here is something called siRNA. So first, I'm gonna draw, and then I'm gonna draw like a simplified version of the diagrams that you see uh, in your notes, and then we'll go back to the diagrams in the notes. Okay. So, siRNA. Uh, you might remember from last session that siRNA has a, two kind of general names they use to describe it. The one that a lot of people uh, call it is a silencing RNA, which is not technically the name of it, but it does give a hint on what this thing will do. So feel free to memorize it as that name. Uh, the actual name of it is short interfering RNA. Interfering. All right, so we went over mRNA, whose job was to encode genes uh, into uh, a transcript. We went over rRNA, which is a component of ribosomes. We went over tRNA, which is that intermediate uh, molecule that holds on to that 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 uh, holds on to amino acids. Uh, now we get to some special ones, and that is siRNA, and the name for it is short interfering RNA. The end goal of siRNA, I'll jump to the end first and explain the intermediate stuff here. The goal of siRNA is to silence expression of a gene. Of a gene. And here, what does that mean? So, silencing RNA is both made naturally and we can do it artificially. In other words, we can uh, create siRNA in the lab and actually uh, induce artificial silencing of gene expression. But what does either of those mean? Well, let's go back to the central dogma. Central dogma says there's some DNA. Uh, actually, I'll draw this horizontally, my bad. There's some DNA, it gets transcribed into RNA, uh, mRNA and mRNA gets translated into proteins, okay? The end goal of siRNA, these small fragments of RNA, what they will do is they will look for a specific mRNA, okay? So these siRNAs are going to look for a specific mRNA and bind to it, okay? So I'm gonna say there's some siRNA here that's floating around, it's going to look for a particular mRNA, bind to it, 
and make it impossible for the mRNA to be translated into protein. Okay, so silencing of gene expression can technically happen many different ways. The way siRNA does it is by interfering with the ability for the mRNA to be translated into protein. Okay, remember that silencing of gene expression means as long as you interfere with any of these steps in the central dogma, as long as you prevent the production of a functional protein, you are silencing the expression of some gene. And you can do it in many different ways. Uh, in 10a, we learned that epigenetics influences gene expression uh, by, D by methylating DNA. Uh, this example of silencing gene expression is that siRNA is kind of like a hunter. It is gonna go look for a particular mRNA strand, bind to it, and in a process I'm gonna talk about in a second, just make it so that it's impossible for uh, a ribosome to actually translate the mRNA into a protein anymore, okay? Again, this siRNA is made both naturally and we can also make it artificially to do experiments, uh, but that's the end goal of siRNA. So now let's go into the actual uh, mechanism, but that's the end goal for it. All right, so where does siRNA come from? siRNA is very unique in terms of naturally made siRNA, and that it actually comes from double-stranded RNA, which sounds weird, right? Uh, we learn, mostly, that only DNA is double-stranded and RNA prefers to be single-stranded. There are a few cases where RNA sometimes comes in a form where it is double-stranded RNA, okay? Uh, there's a few examples, such as viral RNA, and I always forget the other two examples, so pardon me while I go to the slides. Uh, let's see. It is... Da -da. Here's viral RNA right here. Uh, da -da -da. Micro RNA right here. And where is the third example? Something called self-copying gene sequences. I'm not too familiar with that, but in terms of... Uh, memorization and everything. Those three things in red here are your sources of double-stranded RNA that will eventually be used to make siRNA, okay? Uh, but for my explanation, I'm just gonna use the general nomenclature of uh, double-stranded RNA, but there are sources in your notes that will tell you where the double-stranded RNA comes from. Okay, so we start with double-stranded RNA and it goes uh, in, uh, either it is made in a particular cell or it is made outside the cell and gets transported into the cell. And this double-stranded RNA, the very first thing that happens is it encounters an enzyme, an enzyme complex called dicer, which is really nicely named enzyme because it, ver it, it greatly uh, explains what this enzyme does. It's going to chop up, let me extend this a bit, it's going to chop up the double-stranded RNA into little tiny double-stranded pieces, okay? Each of these tiny double-stranded pieces, each one is double-stranded siRNA. Okay. All right, each of the tiny pieces is double-stranded siRNA. These short pieces of double-stranded siRNA are pretty unstable. So actually, after these are made, uh, almost immediately, each of these double-stranded pieces of siRNA will denature to form single-stranded siRNA. Remember, siRNA is short interfering. Oh, I have to go all the way up here, is short interfering RNA. We've made a really small fragment of RNA, and that's why we call it a short interfering RNA. The interfering part you'll see in a second. But this is a really short fragment of RNA that was made because an enzyme dicer was able to find some double-stranded RNA and chop it into pieces, okay? All right, so now, this siRNA, I kind of told you a little bit about what it's going to do, this siRNA is going to find a target mRNA. Okay, I'm gonna to have to draw it down here. 
It's gonna find a target mRNA. What I mean by that is this siRNA has some base pair, uh, base pattern on it. I'm gonna make something up, A-A-T-G. Uh, siRNA is a lot longer than that usually. It's somewhere between 12 and 30 uh, nucleotides long. You don't have to memorize that number. But siRNA is, is, is a lot longer than four bases. But for illustrative purposes, note that siRNA has some pattern attached to it. We know that nucleotide bases like to base pair with, uh, oh, I put a T in here, I just realized, that has to be a U, excuse me, that uh, siRNA or any types of uh, nucleotides like to try to base pair with their complementary base. A's like to bind with T's, G's like to bind with C's. Uh, in terms of RNA, A's like to bind with U's and G's like to bind with C's. But what that ends up meaning is that this small fragment of siRNA is going to find any target mRNA that happens to have a complementary sequence to its pattern. Okay, so as an illustrative example, here's an mRNA strand that's on its way to a ribosome, but here's a siRNA with the base pair AAUG, and on one part of this mRNA, it may have the pattern UUAC. That means it's complementary to this siRNA. This siRNA is going to find this mRNA, and because it's complementary to it, it's going to bind to it. And you have this small region of this mRNA has now all of a sudden become double-stranded, okay? Not the entire thing, just a small portion of this, all right? What ends up happening, this, this subtle little change here, is that an entire complex of proteins is built around this thing. That complex of proteins that is built around this thing is called the risk complex. So if you look in your notes, you'll see that this phrase shows up in the, in the PowerPoint notes of this section here, something called the risk complex. What this is, is a whole bunch of proteins that you don't need to know the individual names of, but a whole bunch of proteins put together where they have this siRNA double-stranded to mRNA. So you create this structure here because a small portion of siRNA was able to find a complementary mRNA strand. This risk complex that builds along this uh, attachment here does one of two things, does one of two things, and both of them silence the expression of the gene. Uh, one possibility is if this siRNA binds very strongly to the target mRNA, it's very highly complementary, this risk complex will destroy the mRNA. Again, that's if the siRNA binds very well to the mRNA. The risk complex, which is a bunch of proteins put together, various enzymes, will go in and destroy the mRNA. The other possibility that this risk complex can do is that even if the siRNA doesn't bind perfectly to the mRNA, let's say it binds just okay, the risk complex will stay bound to the mRNA. It may not be able to destroy it, but this huge structure staying bound to the mRNA makes it impossible for a ribosome to pick up the mRNA and translate it into protein. All right, so again, reiterating, Two possibilities for the risk complex. One, it either destroys the target mRNA, and if so, that makes it definitely impossible to translate it into a protein. Or two, it just stays attached to the mRNA, thus making it impossible for a ribosome to even pick up the mRNA to translate into a protein. The bottom line, no matter which pathway it decides to do, is that you are unable to translate the mRNA into a protein. And if we go way back to the beginning, the reason why that was is because this small interfering RNA is interfering with the translation of this mRNA by binding to it, okay? So for comparison's sake, let's take a look at the picture, at the way better drawn picture they have in the notes after you've been given that intro. So let's see what the pictures in the notes look like as they're a little complicated, but they look better. All right, this first slide, because this siRNA diagrams are split up into two slides, one of them here is talking about how siRNA is made in the first place, and the other slide tells you what siRNA does. 
So this slide is saying, well, there's a bunch of different sources of double-stranded RNA. You get it in the vi uh, from viruses, you get it from microRNAs, and I guess that's self-copying gene sequences. Either one of these sources, when they go into the cytoplasm, they will find an enzyme called dicer, which I drew earlier. This dicer enzyme is just going to, going to cut apart the double-stranded RNA into tiny fragments of double-stranded siRNA. You'll also see that this is the same mechanism to make uh, shorter uh, microRNA strands. Don't worry about what microRNA strands are, that's not talked about in detail in this class. But in terms of siRNA, dicer makes these short siRNA fragments. The next diagram tells you what the siRNA actually does. So starting on the left here, you have this double-stranded siRNA that actually unwinds, like I said earlier, almost immediately unwinds into single-stranded siRNA. And then it's going to travel around the cytoplasm until it can find an mRNA target, indicated in purple on this diagram here, and bind to it. And notice that on this mRNA target, a whole bunch of proteins accumulated around it, forming what is called the risk complex, and that's what the acronym stands for, RNA-induced silencing complex, uh, but it's fine to just memorize it as the risk complex. This risk complex can do one of two possible things illustrated here. One, the risk complex can destroy the mRNA by cutting it into pieces. When you destroy the mRNA by cutting it into pieces, the ribosome is unable to actually make the protein that the mRNA was intended for. The other possibility was that the risk complex just stays bound to the mRNA. And that, again, only happens if the siRNA does not perfectly match the target mRNA. You see this little mismatch here. Well, the risk complex is still able to inhibit the, trans the translation of the mRNA by just creating these large structures on the mRNA strand, uh, making it impossible for a ribosome to translate it. Bottom line, whichever method it decides to use, uh, no protein is made. So this is the mechanistic way of how siRNA works, all right? The most important thing after understanding the mechanism is just what is the general function of siRNA, and again, that is to silence the expression of a particular protein. In terms of medicine, there are a lot of diseases that exist because there's an overexpression of some protein. A lot of uh, genes called oncogenes, which are cancer-causing genes, happen because too much of that protein is made. It's more than what is supposed to be made. So there is currently various therapies called uh, siRNA therapies or inhibitor RNA therapies. It's all under the same umbrella term. Those siRNA treatments, as you can see, are applied because what they will do is they will try to specifically silence the expression of those harmful proteins, uh, doing so by binding to mRNA. All right, so that's to give you a little bit of a better context of why this even matters. Again, there are therapies being done right now where they make artificial siRNA to specifically target uh, mRNA that, is, that would have been translated into a harmful cancer-causing protein. Okay, and I believe that might be one of the next slides. Yeah, this next slide lists a bunch of examples of the uses of interfering RNA. Uh, so you can take a look at that for context purposes, uh, but it's, it, this is more just for context rather than memorization. Again, there's a lot of applications for, uh, for uh, interfering RNA, and some might even say it's actually better than a lot of current uh, chemical inhibitors that we have for proteins. Right now, majority of drugs on the market are, exist to try to inhibit proteins. This is a fairly new technology that exists to try to inhibit the mRNA so that you can't make the protein in the first place. So uh, it's a wide field that's currently being researched. All right. Uh, sometimes, by the way, let's see what I did here. Uh, da, da, da. If Dr. Hastings hasn't talked about it yet, uh, he will. Uh, or if he skipped over it, maybe it's not important this year. Is this particular target? Uh, I don't know much about it, and if it's on the final exam, I'll review it more in detail. But this particular uh, target uh, protein is responsible for a condition called hypercholesterolemia, which just means uh, someone makes uh, higher levels of cholesterol than normal. Uh, that is currently uh, treated via a siRNA drug. Uh, so there may be more details given in class, but that's the limit I have uh, in terms of my personal knowledge on that. 
Uh, so I'm going to skip. Yeah, there's some diagrams on here that illustrate this, uh, but I'm just going to skip right along. Okay. So, before we move on, let's see if we can answer some things to reinforce. Oh, all right, I forgot, to, I forgot to ask you guys about these things. That should be pretty easy. Uh, sometimes on the exam, you may be given a single-stranded nucleotide sequence, and you may be asked to write either the complementary DNA sequence or the complementary RNA sequence. So that shouldn't be too difficult, right? So let's start here. Here's our uh, single-stranded DNA. We need to make a complementary DNA sequence. Uh, remember that DNA uh, is in a double helix shape, but there's another word we use to describe the shape of DNA. Anyone remember what that word is? It's not parallel, it's anti-parallel. The reason why I bring that up is if this strand of DNA is written 5 prime to 3 prime, the complementary strand of DNA needs to start on the 3 prime end. If we're writing the complementary strand of DNA, it has to be anti-parallel to the template strand of DNA. And therefore, that's why I put this direction right here of 3 prime. All right, and now for the easy part. What base matches with A when we're talking about DNA? T's, right? Okay, so T, T, this must be a C, that must be a G, that must be an A, that must be a G, that must be a T. And to finally end it, uh, we have to label this side of the, of the DNA strand, and therefore it has to be the five prime side of the DNA strand, because this DNA strand needs to be anti-parallel to the template strand. So let me just label this template DNA, and this one is complementary. Okay, and this could be one of your answers if they choose to label 3 prime and 5 prime for you. The reason why I say this is, on the exam, two choices might show up. If this was a question, it won't be this easy, but if this shows up as a question, you might see two different answer choices. One will be written like this, and another one will be written like this. I wrote that right, I think so. Which would be the right answer choice, A or B, for the answer for the complementary DNA of that template DNA? Hmm. The answer is actually B, and here's why. A long time ago, a couple sessions ago, I said that if they did not label which side is 5 prime and which side is 3 prime on any answer choice, if they did not label it, what do you have to assume the left side is? Five prime. five prime. Okay. So let's do that. And you have to label the right side three prime. So now what is it? now you guys can see that the actual correct answer, if these were your two answer choices given, has to be answer choice B because uh, if they don't label which side is 5 prime or 3 prime on the answer choices, you have to know ahead of time that the left side will be the 5 prime side and the right side will be the 3 prime side. Let's check that with our answer up here. Starting from the 5 prime side, it should be T, G, A, G, C, T, T. What we've written up up here starting from the 5 prime side is T, G, A, G, C, T, T. So it does fit with what we have written in our scratch notes up there. Okay. So be very careful with that. And again, I will reiterate, if they do not label which side of your answer choice is five prime or three prime, the left side is considered the five prime side and the right side is considered the three prime side. It's a subtle detail, but this is just general practice in uh, molecular biology. Okay. Uh, all right, so we answered that. Uh, just for practice sake, let's also do the complementary uh, mRNA. So same thing, when mRNA is made, it has to be made in an anti-parallel direction compared to the template DNA. Uh, in doing so, uh, what will, bind, what will uh, be on the mRNA uh, if the template strand says uh, A? What base would be here? It'll be U's, right? A is bind to U's, that's got to be a G, uh, excuse me, that has to be a C, that has to be a G, that has to be an A, that has to be a G, and that has to be another U. So this ends up being our complementary RNA. Okay, so again, if you're given any sequence, uh, write out the sequence, label the directions, 
because it's very important because once you, once you get to the answer choices, the direction might be flipped around. Okay, so label the directions on your scratch notes when you're uh, writing it down the complementary DNA or complementary RNA. Okay, moving right along. Okay, uh, I may not have emphasized this enough last class, but there's uh, other things to uh, add to these pictures of nucleotides sometimes when we talk about direction. One of which is a phosphate. This is not always drawn in on a nucleotide sequence, but if it's drawn in, they, they indicate the presence of a uh, terminal phosphate with a lowercase p. So this picture right here is telling you that there's a terminal phosphate on what end of this nucleotide? On the five prime end, because it's on the left side and there's no labels of five prime or three prime here. So in this particular example, there's a five prime phosphate. So going through the true or falses here, uh, this one must, this must be a false statement uh, because the phosphate is actually on the five prime side, not the three prime side. Uh, but what about this one here? It contains a three prime OH. So that is not drawn uh, in your, that is not usually drawn in your nucleotides either. Uh, so if there's an empty space over here, you can assume that there is a OH over there, that there is an OH functional group there. Okay, so again, this is not usually drawn in, but if there's a blank space on that end, you can assume there's an OH on that end. So therefore, this is true. There is a three prime OH there. Uh, true or false, it is composed of ribonucleotides. Hmm. Raise anything true. Raise anything false. All right, and raise anything you think I'm just trying to trick you. Okay, the answer is it is uh, false. And how do I know that? Well, what base is in here? There's a T, right? Is that supposed to be a ribonucleotide or a deoxyribonucleotide? That's supposed to be a deoxyribonucleotide. So, this is a false statement. It is not made of ribonucleotides, it is made of deoxyribonucleotides. And the quickest way to tell is just look at what base is present or not in the uh, sequence. Okay, so there's some practice for you. Uh, going right down along, list the different types of RNA and give their basic functions. I'll leave that to you guys. That's pretty easy to find in your notes. Uh, this is, uh, some of this is easy, and actually I'll go over this one in detail in a second. Uh, but these questions here, which bond is stronger, a GC bond or an AT bond? Gs and Cs, because how many hydrogen bonds will you find in a GC bond? Three hydrogen bonds, As and Ts only have two. Targets rule, we've actually said it many times, that's what the, that's the name of the rule that tells you that As always bind with Ts and Gs always bind with Cs, that's what Targets rule is. Uh, let's see, uh, okay, so we're going to try to answer these two uh, math questions here regarding uh, nucleotides. I believe these are actually the only two math questions that you could potentially get at all on this exam. Uh, so, let's see, a sample of DNA is found to contain 40% adenine. From just that information, Report what percentage of that DNA must be composed of thymine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine. What percentage of the DNA must be composed of those things? So, we'll start with the easy thing. If 40% of it is A, you immediately, you immediately know what percentage must be made of T. 40%, okay. Uh, a bit of a tricky part, but how much uracil would there be in DNA? Zero, right, or negligible at the very least, so there should be zero uracil. Now, 40% of it was A, and 40% of it was T, so we're left with just 20% left over. Uh, anyone want to guess how much it must be G and how much must be C? Each one needs to be 10%, all right? 10% G and 10% C, because that adds up to the missing 20%. So that one's easy, all right? I have to move along since we're running out of time. This one is actually a little bit more complicated. Uh, so I'll see if I can go over it in two minutes. If not, I'll go over it again next session. Uh, okay, a single strand of DNA, not double-stranded. A single strand of DNA contains 40% G, 30% C, 20% T, and 10% A. In fact, I'm going to draw this one. Uh, let me draw it real quick, and then I'll flip to the camera. 
Okay. Okay, sorry for my bad handwriting, but this is what we have here. A single stranded uh, uh, DNA strand is composed of these percentages of these bases. They want you to figure out what is the percentage of, I'll pick one here, might be different from what it's asking. What's the percentage of G in double-stranded DNA? Okay, so... So it may look easy, but it, 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 it might not be as easy as you think. And the way to solve this is if you have the information for one strand of DNA, you also have the information of the other strand of DNA. If this strand here is made of 40% G, what must be 40% down here? C's, right? Because if this one is G's, this has to be an equal amount of C's. Over here, if it's 30% C's, what must be 30% down here? G's, good. This one here must be 20% what? A's, good, because it has to equal because of Chargaff's rule. And this one here must be 10% T's, okay? So if you add up all the percentages, this ends up actually equaling 200%, which is too much. So if the question is asking, what is the percentage of G in double-stranded DNA? Well, let's see, there's a G right there and there's a G right there. Uh, everything adds up to 200%, so that isn't exactly right. So what you end up doing is you do 40% plus 30% divided by two, and that will tell you what percentage of Gs there are in double-stranded DNA. So I think that comes out to 35% uh, G in double-stranded DNA, okay? You can do this for anyone. If it was asking for what percentage of A's are there in double-stranded DNA, what percentage of A's? Well, you add up the A's, 10% and 20% is, comes out to 30%. You divide the 30% by two, because there's too much percentage up here, and that comes out to 15% A's, okay? So be very careful and read the question carefully. All right, it will mention, it will give you information for single-stranded DNA, and they want double-stranded answer. All right, that's it for now. Whoever has the answer, uh, the uh, sign-in sheet, please bring it up here.